<laughs> this is Resident 104.4 FM. Flipping marvellous, as always. Uh, I'm Nick Hennigan, and welcome to another slice of Literary London, where we talk about, well, things kind of literary and sort of London-y, generally. Um, and for the, uh, the, the, the sort of wide-eared for you, if you're listening in stereo, you may also know that we're recording this. We're in video as well. Yes, we're live. I'm waving my hands at you now, which is uh, rather glorious because this time it is my privilege to say I am joined by the actor Jeffrey Holland. Hi, Jeff. Hello. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Good. Nice to see you. I mean, literally to see you. The um, the video for this, if you want to see myself and Jeffrey in our glorious, gloriousness, uh, will be on, as always, will be on bohemianbritain.com uh, and various YouTube channels. Um, but we're here to, I've got to say, hi, dear, hi. Hello. <laughs> Um, Jeff, of course, Jeffrey Holland. I mean, we do have a worldwide audience, but I'm sure everyone in the world has heard of of a rather brilliant uh, sitcom that, that I suppose would you say it's the first brought you to fame? Is a called oh, Fair comment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. My name on the map and the name to the face, as it were. You know. Yeah. And it was it ran for years, didn't it? We'll, we will talk about that in a bit as well. Because I'd be interested to know how. Uh, I mean, because we're both in West London as well, aren't we? And occasionally, I, I bump into you at the local theatres and stuff. But we've never had a kind of a, a, a proper chat about things. But let's just talk to, to, to about the show. It's called After All These Years, uh, written by Giles Cole. And um, just tell us a little bit about that. It's running at the Tabard Theatre, which is in West London. And I'll give you the details of how you can get in touch with the Tabard later. Just tell us a bit about this show. Well, it's a, it's a forehander in as much as there are two couples, two married couples in it. And they've known each other for 40, 50 years. They've been together as a gang, as a group of friends. Uh, closely linked. They both uh, couples were in show business. That's where they met. Uh, the two girls were chorus girls, dancers. One one was a, a dance captain in charge of the group. Uh, the uh, one of the men was uh, the company manager uh, and a stage manager. That was the part I play. And the other fellow was a, a comic, a stand-up comic. And they all worked together in in a variety in summer season. Uh, and then they all left. Eventually, when you know they got to that age, and uh, and then we'll work together in a, in a department store, which is yeah, a different world altogether. But you know they're still together, and the, the 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 play is actually in three rather clever parts. It's the first scene is the two chaps talking in the pub over a pint, literally that. Uh, about their lives and their wives and whatever has happened in the past. The second scene is the, is the lady, ladies doing exactly the same thing in one of their apartments, you know, over a gin and tonic and some nibbles. Uh, and uh, and the, the, then there's an interval. And in, in the third part of the play, uh, it's two years later and everything has changed. You know, their relationships have gone down different routes uh, and uh, you, you, the things happen that you didn't expect to happen, and everything completely has changed in, uh, with their relationships to to each other and with each other. So it's it's worth it's worth the wait. I promise you. <laughs> it sounds fantastic. I mean, I've, I've not actually seen it yet. I know it's your press night tonight, I believe, and I'm coming in on on uh, Friday. Um, and it, it's already done rather well, hasn't it? You did sort of won awards at the Brighton Fringe, I think, and you... you did it last, last summer, yes. It won, it won uh, Best New uh, Piece. I can't remember the exact title, but it was the Best New uh, Work and won an award for that at the Brighton Fringe. And we've done... Uh, we did two, two weeks at the German Street Theatre in London with it the back end of last year. And here we are at the Tabard. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's a, it's a, I love a little space as well, isn't it? The Tabard. I mean, I think the first time I went there, actually, there weren't any seats. I mean, you just kind of, it was a black box and doing all sorts of experimental theatre. But the, the 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 couple that run that have done a great job there. They do, they do indeed. They, uh, I started my one man show off there um, years ago, and uh, it's the perfect little space for it, you know. Um, and it, it's so adaptable and versatile as a little theatre. You do anything there. It is kind of one of the glories of London, isn't it? And it seems to be only London 
that has these these little uh, establishments, maybe pub theatre. We know about pub theatre. I mean, I'm from Birmingham originally, and I, uh, I did a show that got picked up. Uh, in fact, if you're, you're watching, you can see on the thing called Henry V Line of England, which got picked up by Jasper Carrot Management, would you believe, and taken to the Edinburgh Festival back in 1992. Uh, and what blew me away was, I have never been to the Edinburgh Fringe before, what blew me away was not just the Edinburgh Festival, it was the fact there was so much theatre everywhere. And then I'm thinking, Birmingham, Britain's second city, having got a single pub theatre. Uh, so we that's that's how I got messed up in theatre. But I mean London's kind of got a worldwide reputation for theatre, hasn't it? And and those 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 smaller spaces above pubs are where some brilliant new work can be can be made and created. That's very true. And what about yourself then, Jeffrey? So are you are you a local? Are you a Londoner originally? No, oh, I'm from the Midlands. Uh, you may notice in the accent occasionally slips. Oh, but awesome. <laughs> drink or I'll get cross. Were your family sort of into theatre? Is that what got you involved? No, I, I, I was. I got involved with amateur theatre uh, simply because I was bored stiff with going to a boring youth club every Sunday with my friend, and he found this amateur dramatic society for under twenty ones, and we went along and. Uh, because he told me the girls were all very, very pretty. So, uh, you know, I got, I got started due to my raging hormones. So that's how I got into acting in the first place. And uh, you know, I realised that I, I loved it and, and, you know, there was nothing really else I wanted to do. So when the time came right, I made the move and went pro. So and you're did, right. you, did you train? Did you go to drama school? I trained at the uh, Birmingham School of Speech and Drama uh, for three years in the mid-60s. And uh, I was very lucky to to get a, a a really good grounding there. And then I I went straight into rep at Coventry at the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry. Uh, so I learned my trade li literally. Yes, I was an actor called Paul Henry who uh, who also trained at Birmingham. Chappies, he's talking about Miss Chappies. Uh, also trained. He was in a a, a a drama soap that ran in the UK for a long time called Crossroads. Yeah. Uh, which of course yeah. is currently trendy, trendy again, or trending again, because Russell T Davies, the creator of Doctor Who, has written a drama about Noel Gordon, who I also kind of knew a little bit, called Nolly, uh, which is worth checking out for. Um, and then, so you were doing, I mean, the rep system, for those that, uh, and I, you know, the, the rep was kind of an interesting system, wasn't it? So it meant you were an actor, and you worked kind of full-time for a theatre, and then did lots and lots of different shows. That must have been fairly interesting was interesting it was also exhausting uh, because you know the older you got the more worn out you were i was a very very young man in my early 20s i was only 22 when i joined the company and, and uh, i worked there for nearly five years and, and literally learned my trade i did everything you name it from agatha christie to pantomime musicals uh, you know the, the lot it was a, a wonderful uh, grounding for me to uh, to learn my trade that way and uh, yeah, and, and you rehearsed the play, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you played a play for three weeks. And once the play had opened, you started rehearsals for the next one. So you were rehearsing during the day for the next play while you were playing another one in the evening. And then you were also thinking about the one that came after the next one. So you knew what you were up for. You know, it was a very, very busy way of life. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it stood me in very good stead for, for anything that people throw at me these days, you know, if I could do that, I can do anything. Yeah, I mean, that does sound incredibly exhausting as well. I, and uh, I won't state the obvious question, but how did you remember the words? <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, like, what show am I on now? And because uh, um, that was, yes, because it used to be weekly rep, didn't it? Didn't they used to do it once every week going back even? Well, they, yeah, there was weekly rep, yes, but that was before my time. When I went into rep, it was three weekly, thank goodness. So we yeah. had to at each play. I mean, is there anything around with younger actors? Uh, is there? A, I suppose there's nothing kind of similar to that nowadays, is there? What's that? That 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 training ground that you got that you had. I mean, what would a, what would a young actor be doing nowadays? I guess not that. Because kids coming out of drama school uh, these days, you know, they're not trained in the same way I was. Um, sadly, they don't seem to train them in voice production. To uh, these days, you know, I, I was trained in the proper way to produce a voice to, to fill a theatre and reach the back of the gods. Little old deaf old lady who's sitting at the back of the, the gods, you know, on a Wednesday afternoon. She wants to hear you as well, and you've got to project project your voice. And it, that was a technique that I was taught, and they don't seem to use that anymore because the the use of amplification now is is so uh, you know available, as it were. Um, and kids come out of drama school expected to go straight into EastEnders, 
or something, or, you know, or whatever, Emma Dale, and, and become famous yeah. for the sake of it. But you know, yeah, I just wanted to earn a living and be an actor, you know, and I, and I got my wish, and I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, fantastic! It's a great story. And what did? How did the television thing come along? I mean, it was Croft and Perry and Croft who wrote those those kind of sitcoms during the was it seventies? I suppose it would have been. Was it seventies and eighties? Seventy-five. I was recruited uh, to go and audition uh, for the Dad's Army stage show, which was being produced and put on at the Shaftesbury Theatre in London's West End uh, by Perry and Croft. And directed by Roger Redfarn, who who actually had worked with me at Coventry, so he knew me and he knew what I was capable of, and he thought I could be very useful to to the show. And I went to an audition for Perry and Croft, and I got the job. Uh, and I spent you know a lovely, wonderful year with that show, six months in the West End at the Shaftesbury Theatre, and then we went on national tour with the show. Uh, for six months after that, in the early uh, months of 1976. And I was asked to play Private Walker, the Spiv. Huh? And there I was, because I'd understudied it. And uh, J uh, John Barden was playing it in the West End because James Beck had died two years previously. And they put the character back in, played by J John Barden, because uh, he was such a good foil for Captain Mannery. And uh, you know all the TV cast were there except John Laurie, sadly, because he was rather frail and he didn't want to leave his wife uh, to do that. So he he was replaced with a a, a look and sound alike. Uh, and uh, he, and then I was playing Private Walker at the age of twenty nine. I was a member of Captain Mannering's platoon. You know, it was fantastic, <laughs> great, great job for me, wonderful. And then this is yeah. that, history with Perry and Crofts. Um, I've guested in, um, after that, in the next few years, I guested uh, in It Ain't Half Hot Mom. I guested in uh, I, Are You Being Served? Uh, I even did an episode of the final series of Dad's Army. I was uh, played an army truck driver in that. It's one of those uh, don't blink or you'll miss me thing opportunity. <laughs> well, um, there I am. Yeah. Um, and, and then when Heidi High came along, they, they wrote Spike with me in mind. So, because they knew me so well then, you see, they'd used me a lot, uh, knew my capabilities, and uh, and and Spike was, you know, what put me on the map. Wonderful. It's kind of lovely when that happens. I know we've looked, just lost recently poor old Ian Lavender, who was the uh, who played Private Pike in uh, Dad's Army, and I, I I kind of knew him a little bit. He he said the thing that struck him mainly about the about doing Dad's Army, and I guess it must have been a bit similar for you. He's, he's, he was quite a young actor when he first took on the. TV role and he said I was there with all these kind of gods of film you know the kind of the Le Misier and, and Arthur Lowe <clears throat> all these people he said I'd, I'd watched in films as it was as a boy and here I am sort of working with them I, I guess that must be fairly intimidating but I'm also guessing they would have been fairly nice about it well yeah I mean there's a, there a, a lovely story there because when I was in the uh, the, the ensemble company and in the West End version of the, uh, the show I was asked to understudy Private Walker and Private Pike, yeah. Ian Lavender's part, and uh, and I had to go on once for Ian. Uh, he was not available for um, a Wednesday Saturday one week, and so I, I knew this was coming up. And I, I put the uniform on. I put the scarf. I'm the only other actor in the country ever, in the world even, I think, to to have worn that Aston Villa scarf. <laughs> yeah, that's Pike. Uh, so you know, I put the hat on with the little pointy bits. You know, put the scarf on it. All the words came out in the right order. Everyone got their right cues. But I never got a single laugh all afternoon. That audience was so unforgiving because I was not Ian Lavender. Who's yeah. that stranger up there pretending to be Private Pike? It's not him. <laughs> the only laughs I got were from the boys and girls on the stage behind me who were sniggering out of their sleeves because I wasn't getting laughs. <laughs> experience that you know but then came the national tour and because i i understudied walker as well although i never played the part i knew the lines and they and they asked me to play the part because uh, they saved they saved a salary and they didn't have to rehearse <laughs> yeah <laughs> <They did. They're> <laughs> practicalities of theater of course at the end yeah it's 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 bit, it was i mean iconic really wasn't it uh, i wonder whether those were 
I wonder if it's because of, obviously, talent aside or talent accepted, the fact that those audiences were so huge, certainly in the UK, that when you'd only got, I suppose, three or four, three channels, I suppose. I mean, when I was a, when I were a lad, there were only two channels. Um, and Because the audiences were huge, weren't they? I mean, millions and millions of people will watch you every week. Yeah, that's, it. that's exactly what happened. I mean, it was the same with Heidi High for us when we started in, um, in 1980. Uh, you know, there were only three channels then. Uh, and we were pulling at our peak you know, a couple of years later. We were pulling eighteen and a half, nineteen million viewers a week for each show. You know, you, you can't do that now. It's impossible. You know, with the share of the channels, we've got seven hundred and some odd now available. But you know, we only we only had three then, and then there was four. You know, and what it's amazing, amazing time to have lived through. Yeah, isn't it? Just I mean, I know I used to start writing when the telly shut down at midnight. <laughs> wouldn't happen now. Uh, I'm Nick Hennigan. This is Literary London on Resonance 104.4 FM. We're also on Envision in beautiful, sort of nearly technicolour uh, on bohemianbritain.com. I'm in the company of Geoffrey Holland, the actor who is performing in a show called After All These Years by Giles Cole, which is at the uh, Tabard Theatre in West London in Chiswick. I'll give you the details uh, later on. I mean, how did it, <clears throat> how was, oh, I must just say hello to, hello to Kathy California. Thank you for getting in touch. Uh, Kathy emails every week. Although apparently, yes, she's, uh, she said she, it's been a bit rough this week in California. So if you're in California, take care of yourselves. Uh, Kath always used to listen on the beach, but apparently they've had a bit of bad weather. Uh, and also hello to uh, Joanne, who is in South Africa. Hello, Joanne. Thank you. That's my regular call. So I tend to email every week just to say hello. So hello. Um, Je Jeffrey Holland, so, so talking uh, the actor, um, there was Heidi Fire, you rang my lord. How was it as a as a young actor? So, and as you say, you really wanted to be an actor. That was your aspiration. It wasn't to be famous. How did how did how how did it sit suddenly becoming famous? That must have been a slightly surreal experience when you've got, they say, 18 and a half million people looking at you every week. How, how did that work? How did that cope? How did you cope with that? It took me completely by surprise because uh, in 1980, when the the first series went out, you know, after episode three had aired, three weeks into it, literally, I was in Watford doing some shopping with my, uh, my then wife, uh, and we were walking down the high street in Watford, and I heard somebody shout, Heidi, hi! And I thought, my God, I've been recognised. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? Because it had never happened to me before. And there was no reason for it to. You know, but I wore big John Major style glasses in those days. I've always worn glasses. And uh, and I thought, well, this was my disguise, my Clark Kent, you know, and uh, nobody would know who I was. But, uh, you know, as I thought, somebody's recognised me. And how do I re react? Oh, my God, I've got to be nice, be nice, be nice, smile. So I turned round to roughly where the voice had come from across the street. And it wasn't me he was shouting at. This young lad was shouting Heidi hi to his mate who was up the street just behind me. You know, it, it had taken off that quickly. And people were shouting Heidi hi to each other in the street. And I thought it was me. But you know, I got used to it eventually. I'm better, I'm better now. But <laughs> Yes, it can, it can be a double-edged sword, can't it? Being famous, I know. Uh, I had a, a tiny slice of it when I was on the radio in Birmingham at BRB and then WM, uh, and it draped for about a week. And then I mean, I was just a voice; it wasn't even a face. But as you can see, I've got the perfect face for radio. Hey, thank you. Uh, but uh, yes, I, I found it. I, I also understand why there are so many members clubs in London because you can go there and people don't snap you, and uh, you, you don't have to worry about about. Uh, uh, yes, I, yes, I'm about to say how much. I'm about to break your confidence myself then. <laughs> so, um, and what 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 happened? At, so you did Heidi High, and then uh, you rang my lord came along. That was a that was from the same stable, presumably. Oh yes, we were during the penultimate series of, of Heidi High in 1986. Um, one day during rehearsals, Jimmy Perry and David Croft um, dropped Paul Shane and Sue Pollard and myself together and said. Would you please stay behind when rehearsals finishes? Because we we'd like to have a little chat with the three of you. And um, we all thought, oh God, what have we done? Are we get in the sack. What's happened? You know, uh, we had no idea. We were quite very no. struggling. But afterwards, everyone was dismissed, and they sat us down. Uh, and then they told us that the following year, eighty-seven, would be the final series of Heidi High. Yeah, you know, they'd written it out. They'd written all the all the gags and wheezes that they could. Um, glean from their experience in the holiday camps themselves, 
and they started to make things up and it wasn't going to be quite as funny. So they thought they'd knock it on the head while it was, you know, really leave them wanting, as it were. Uh, but having said that, they'd got an idea for another program. They got a uh, a thing that well, they wanted to do, like virtually a comedy version of Upstairs, Downstairs to start off with. That's how it sort of started off as an idea. <clears throat> with us playing the uh, the downstairs staff, you know, me, the, the footman, Paul as the butler, and uh, Sue as the, as the maid, who also happened to be the butler's daughter, in you know, as it turned out. Um, but the, the, they set it, the, the, original, the original idea was to set it in the abdication years, during the 30s. And Mary Husband, who did all, designed all David Croft's costumes for his various shows, said, no, don't set it in the 30s, set it in the 20s, because the costumes for the ladies would be so gorgeous and glamorous and exuberant and full of style, you know, as indeed for the men in some ways, but, you know, particularly for the ladies, the, the 20s was wonderful. And uh, so they did, they brought it back into the 1920s, you know, just before the Great Wall Street crash. Uh, so they set it in 1927. And uh, and it was what well, you know if you know the show what a success it was. Uh, a pity they don't repeat it, sadly, uh, because it's fifty minutes long. That's probably the reason why it, it was the first sitcom that be, became a fifty-minute show. Uh, because uh, you know David wanted to get the opportunity to sell it abroad, and, and with the commercial break, you could make it into an hour. That was the that was a theory, uh, but you know it was a, a fifty-minuter. And uh, we did four series of, of 20, 26 50-minute episodes over the next four years of that. And, uh, and <clears throat> that's but that's why they wanted to keep us together, because they they knew that we we were friends, which indeed we, we were, and of course Sue and I are still very close. And, uh, and they liked what we did together. And we were so different, I think, as individuals, physically, visually as well as you know our, our personalities uh, and uh, that was the chemistry that worked so well between us uh, and it, it proved itself again in, in you rang my lord that, uh, that they, did, they were right and it did work it was a fab fabulous show and it was a, so, the production values were so high you know it was like work, working at a real house it was three-dimensional at that, that house you know there's we did half the show pre-recorded uh, the sets at the back of the studio the audience couldn't see and then in the second week we recorded the scenes that the audience could see at the front we had obviously the kitchen scene and the hallway and then the, the, the study and the you know various other little bits uh, so they really put it all together like that but it was a, it was a, a wonderful show to work on really a fantastic opportunity great okay. part of me. Mm -hmm. For me, as James Twelve Trees, the footman, the snotty footman, you know, biggest snob in the house, you know, and expected he knew his place and he expected everyone else to know theirs. And of course, it was the butt of all the jokes, you know, it was virtually a straight role for me within the comedy framework of the piece, you know, virtually a straight role. So it was nice to stretch a few acting muscles out and stretch for a while, you know, that was nice. lots, of, lots of reaction. <laughs> Yeah, it is a shame they don't show that that uh, that nowadays. As you say, fifty minutes gets quite radical, isn't it? What what? So what? Did you think that might go on, or did everyone think that might go on? Three C. I know there was a, that great quote that I heard about uh, TV comedy uh, called "Jumping the Shark," which goes back to the, the days of Happy Days, which is an American sitcom with the farms and his Henry, Henry Winkler. And apparently, they made it was kind of uh, I think it was sort of gossip I heard in, in Hollywood that that the term "Jumping the Shark." Meant that they'd run out of, they'd basically run out of ideas. So many of them, but it was so successful, they just kept trying to churn it out. And there's one episode where they have the Fonz jumping over a shark. It's oh. kind of, it was just, it was so tenuous that and I've heard that term a few times from one or two of my mates in Hollywood. They had to jump on the shark series, which means that you know, I suppose the the, the, the clever thing with Perry and Croft is that they knew when to when to end. Was was you rang my lord? Were there any chances of that going on, or was it a similar call? No, I think they run out of uh, of ideas, and they they weren't getting much support from the up uh, from the upper floors at the time as well. You know, BBC was changing, and that we were, we moved on into O oh, Doctor Beachy a couple of years later, um, and and things were very very different. Uh, the world was changing in the mid nineties. You know, the, the world was changing, comedy was changing, the BBC was changing. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and you know that kind of comedy was no longer required. Thank you very much. It was all going down the road of stuff like Men Behaving Badly, which was slightly more adult, shall we say? You know, nothing wrong with it. It was a bit brilliantly written show and beautifully played by the able cast. Uh, but it was going in that direction, and and uh, the David Croft kind of family comedy, if you like, good clean family fun, was uh, was not. No longer required, thank you very much. It was very sad, but that's you know, that's life. That's the way it goes. And, and what, you... what did you do? What? How did it take you? Did you manage to get... Oh, sorry. Go on, sorry. Still talking about it, though, aren't we? 40 odd years later, we're still talking about it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the mark of, a mark of great quality. And so what, what happened after that? Presumably, did you go back to the theatre or were you doing other television mainly? Pretty much, no. I haven't really done any television apart from interviews and stuff like that. Uh, since then, uh, but mostly my work is in the theatre now. You know, Judy and I, we're both we're working together in this play, this one we're talking about, The Tabard, uh, and we've done a lot of stuff together over the years, uh, over the last 20 years in, in fact. You know, we've done pantomimes together, we've done touring uh, shows around the country, and uh, and here we are again working together as man and wife. As Fantastic. Very yeah. fun. Do you have a preference? I mean, I, you must get asked that all the time. Would you prefer to do a theatre or TV? Yeah. Most actors will tell you that they are they prefer the live theatre. I certainly do. You know, particularly when you're doing comedy, because you're relying on them, the audience to laugh in the right places, and you you can feed off that. You know, it's a great adrenaline buzz. And uh, drama's good too when you get the silences as opposed to the laughs. You know, you know they're listening to you, and uh, it, it's you know, it's terrific. I mean, television is lovely. I mean, it's nice. But if you make a mistake, you could do it again. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that was a very rare thing in, in a David Croft show because David was quite, you know, a strict worker and you knew where you stood with him. You know, you got on with it, so you did the job. Uh, you didn't get many mistakes. There were very few David Croft outtakes available. You know, <laughs> just didn't do them. And uh, we got on with it, but in the, it's the, the theatre, I think, is our main main love. Certainly, is, and I do wonder, you know, because we're all so connected now that the, the, hopefully the swing back, because there is that thing about the the audience being almost the the, the, the other cast member, as, as you say, because it's so organic and every night's different. It is, it is, it is different because you get a different audience and you get different reactions, different balance every night. So you go out there fresh, although you're doing the same thing. You you know you you it's different. But the same. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> lovely to chat to you. Yeah. Um, we'll uh, we've run out of time, which is amazing. We could go for hours. Actually, that's always that's always the case with this. Uh, so uh, the production is called After All These Years. It's written by Giles Cole. It's starring Jeffrey Holland, Ray, and of course the lovely wife Judy Buxton. And does, does, who else is in it? Offhand, I've not much of a flyer with me. Graham Hartney and Carol Ball. Brilliant. Does, oh yes. And so, and there's a lot of television experience amongst all of you. You've all kind of done other things, haven't you? Which is glorious, really. Um, if you'd like to know any more, Theatre at the Tabard, which is on Bath Road in Chiswick, uh, it's probably best to check out their website at uh, tabard.org.uk. Uh, the show runs, depending on when you're listening to this, this is now because these, 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 uh, these little podcasts and, and uh, videos hang on forever. <laughs> but if you want to know any more about Jeffrey, have you got a personal website, Jeffrey, or is it, uh, is it just... It was www.jeffreyholland.co.uk. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Brilliant. jeffreyholland.co.uk or for after all these years, uh, tabard.org.uk. And of course, as always, if you'd like to get in touch, you can do. It's radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk. It's probably still the best email address. Radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk. And I've got my own now. It's nick at bohemianbritain.com. Get me, Nick at BohemianBritain.com. So thank you so much again for your time, Jeffrey, and your your recollections. Um, and good luck with the uh, with, with the show. I shall I shall see you. I'll see you in the bar afterwards on Friday. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and uh, I shall see you next time. Thank you for listening, stroke watching on BohemianBritain.com. I'm Nick Hennigan. This is Literary London on Residence One Hundred Four Point Four FM. <laughs>